The idea of hypersonic planes has been very popular lately. It was no less popular in the middle of the past century, the only difference being that now we are talking deadly weapon. Back then it used to be a huge research program, aiming at gaining valuable insights for military and civil application in the United States. 60 years ago flight tests of the world's first manned aircraft which was able to accelerate to hypersonic speed and perform suborbital flights, had started. You are watching Angels of the Sky channel, and today we'll discuss the experimental rocket-powered aircraft North American X-15. Hypersonic man flight exploration started back in 1943. Back then, the United States Air Force, in collaboration with National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, arranged development of an experimental aircraft which would be able to break the sound barrier. The development was commissioned to an American company, Bell. The first two airplanes developed under this program, were named XS-1, but soon the S disappeared from the name. As the turbojet engines of the time were unable to provide the thrust power required, the company chose to equip the airplane with rocket engine. While waiting for the engines to be shipped by the producer, the Bell engineers suggested to start flight tests without them, using a modified heavy bomber B-29. After gaining the required altitude, X-1 separated from the carrier and performed gliding flight. This way the Bell experts wanted to make sure, that the aircraft was suitable for the research purposes. This decision was bound to become the key to the program's success. Built for a conventional ground start, X-1 consumed most fuel when accelerating and gaining height. Accelerating to hypersonic speed in this case became near impossible. Start from a carrier aircraft is quite another story. In this scenario, the airplane already has decent speed at the drop, while the fuel tanks are still full. All the record-setting flights within the program were performed using air launch. The first experimental plane X-1 broke the sound barrier in autumn 1947. A year and a half later, when it reached the end of its lifespan, it had achieved a record Mach number of 1.41 and maximum altitude of nearly 22,000 meters. The Air Force, inspired by the success, commissioned Bell to build four more upgraded X-1 airplanes. A rush toward higher Mach numbers and bigger altitudes started. As a result, the planes reached double the sonic velocity, and the altitude of 27.5 kilometers. The data, collected during the X-1 project factored heavily the USA fighter aviation of the latter half of the 20th century. Before the program was terminated, the U.S. military, in collaboration with the Committee for Aeronautics, launched the next project in 1949. Its central objective was observing the physical processes, associated with hypersonic velocity. The experimental airplanes, developed by Bell for this program, are known under the name of X-2. Unlike the X-1 prototypes, they had swept wings and a more powerful rocket engine with adjustable thrust. X-2 were geared only for air launch from a carrier airplane, namely, a refitted bomber Boeing B-50. To the commissioner's huge disappointment, the project didn't last long. Both airplanes were lost. First one burned down in the air along with its carrier in spring 1953, the other got wrecked, symbolically, in the final phase of the flight in autumn 1956, after setting up a speed record. X-2 accelerated to 3.2 Mach at altitude of 20,000 meters, which is 3,399 kilometers per hour, using more conventional units. Three weeks before the crash, the plane set a flight altitude record, which was previously held by X-1. The X-2 test pilot managed to climb up to 38.5 kilometers. After losing both airplanes, the Bell Company tried to use X-1E prototype to achieve triple speed of sound, to get on with the research, but this did not produce the desired results, the airplane barely accelerated past 2 Mach. But the story of man flights accelerating to big Mach numbers was not over. Quite the opposite, while Bell was busy developing X-1 and X-2, the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics was hatching much more ambitious plans. They were planning to develop an experimental aircraft, which would be able to reach upper atmosphere at hypersonic speed. After approval by the military, who
who were also interested in such research, a program emerged, which was named X-15. The manned airplanes, developed under this project, were aimed at solving a wide variety of problems. The most crucial of them being the impact, which high speeds and high temperatures would have on materials, used in the plane construction, providing fail-safe operation of control and measuring equipment and onboard systems of the aircraft, human body reaction to zero gravity state and g-force, as well as studying physical characteristics of the upper atmosphere. Following a competition among aircraft building companies, in November 1955, the North American company received a contract to build three manned airplanes X-15. Three and a half years later, in June 1959, flight tests started. X-15 was a mid-wing aircraft with straight trapezoidal wing and wide tail. It was equipped with a single rocket engine. The engineers had in mind a rocket plane which would be able to accelerate to 6 Mach, and perform controlled flights at altitudes as high as 80 km. For efficient handling in dense atmosphere, as well as rarefied atmosphere at bigger altitudes, the designers resorted to combined control. At altitudes below 35 km X-15 maneuvered using aerodynamic surfaces. The thin straight wing with a span of 6.8 meters was equipped with small surface flaps, the rear part was equipped with a flying tailplane, with its surfaces at a negative angle to the horizontal plane. X-15 had both main fin and ventral tail fin. The fins were divided into two sections, fixed panel and turning end panel. Before landing, the turning end panel of the ventral fin was discarded and dropped by parachute. This way it could be reused. The distinctive feature of both fins was their tapered form, which provided longitudinal stability of X-15 at high presonic velocity. The fixed fin panels were equipped with brake flaps for effective braking in the dense atmosphere. At altitudes above 35 km, where aerodynamic surfaces are less effective, exhaust nozzles were used for airplane control, the ones located on the wingtip were used for lateral control while the ones on the nose were used for azimuth and longitudinal control. To fuel the system, concentrated hydrogen peroxide was used, which breaks down into oxygen and superheated vapor. X-15 prototypes were equipped with a single XLR-99 rocket engine, produced by reaction motors. Its maximum thrust was 26 tons. The engine ran on ammonia and liquid oxygen, which were stored in separated tanks. The tanks contained up to 8.5 tons of fuel. This amount of fuel was enough for XLR-99 to run on maximum thrust for 85 seconds. As excessive surface heating is inevitable during flights at supersonic speed, particular requirements were imposed on the materials. Stainless steel and titanium alloys were used for higher durability. Incanalex material was used the most. This alloy of chromium and nickel, capable of sustaining temperatures over 600 degrees Celsius, was extensively used in X-15 construction. In addition, the airplane was painted using a special black paint, which could briefly withstand excessive heating. X-15 was handled by a single pilot, wearing a hermetically sealed ventilated suit. The cockpit was equipped with an ejection seat to be used in emergency situation, which allowed the pilot to evacuate at the speed of up to 4,000 km per hour in altitudes of up to 35 km. It's hard to imagine, what would happen to the pilot ejecting in such circumstances. Admittedly, the ejection seat was never used. The pilot controlled X-15 using a central stick and foot plates, manipulating the moving parts of aerodynamic surfaces. At higher altitudes, reaction control system was activated, with its control handles located to the left and right of the pilot. The cockpit was equipped with liquid nitrogen refrigeration system, to carry the heat away from the scorching hot windscreen. X-15 had tricycle landing gear, which was extended under gravity. The nose landing gear was two-wheeled, main strut was equipped with steel skis. Jet bomber Boeing B-52 was used as the carrier. Compared to the pistol type B-29 and B-50, used for the X-1 and X-2 projects, it had significantly higher flight speed and altitude. 
Two bombers were used in the project, under designators NB-52A and NB-52B. For X-15 suspension, a special pier was installed on the right wing panel, between the hull and the nearest engines. A small cutout had to be made in the wing structure to accommodate the vertical fin of the rocket plane. One of the reasons for this was that X-15 had to be moved to the fore, so that the pilot could be ejected safely, without being barred by the carrier plane's wing. During flight to the takeoff position, part of oxidizer supply would evaporate, and so the carrier plane was equipped with additional liquid oxygen tanks, supplying X-15 before the launch. The vast majority of test flights went on as follows, the carrier plane gained altitude of 13.5 km and velocity of about 850 km per hour, after which the rocket plane was released. Two or three seconds after the release, the rocket engine started, then the X-15 pilot set the required pitch attitude angle, and maintained it until the engine stopped. The plane continued ballistic flight with the speed acquired. In case of high altitude flights, the pilot was in zero gravity state. Normally, this phase lasted for two or three minutes. On entering dense atmosphere, X-15 decelerated using brake flaps, then landed in the dried up lake bed. Now to the most intriguing part. Official flight tests of the X-15 program started on June 8, 1959 when the rocket plane was first separated from the carrier and performed a gliding flight with the engine off. During the next flight, on 17th of September of the same year, it was turned on for the first time. X-15 climbed up to 15 km and accelerated to double the sonic velocity. The following year and a half, the flight results did not differ much. The XLR-99 engine was developed only in November 1960, up until then, a couple of XLR-11 engines were used as a temporary substitute, the same engines were used for X-1 prototypes. In 1961, all three X-15 were put into operation, and equipped with XLR-99 operational engines. The tests kicked off into high gear. By summer 1962, flight speed of around 6 Mach and maximum altitude of 75.2 km were registered. The first test stage was completed. X-15 proved their potential, and the project supervisors started to make arrangements for a new testing procedure. The preparations did not take long, and the flights resumed in the second half of the same year. Special attention was focused on reaching higher altitudes, which was soon accomplished. In summer 1962, the third prototype reached altitude of almost 96 kilometers. A year later, it set an unofficial altitude record for a manned aircraft, 107.9 km. The record flight speeds required a particular approach. In the end of 1962, after an emergency landing, the second X-15 prototype had to undergo a substantial modification. His hull was now 74 cm longer, it was equipped with two drop fuel tanks, which allowed the engine to run for 150 seconds. The control system was significantly modified too, to improve flight stability at high presonic velocity. Flight tests of the modified X-15 prototype started in summer 1964. After some time it was covered by a multi-layer heat reflective coating, which was pink. The top wide paint layer covered the color, so unpopular in aviation. This coating saved the plane during its record flight, on October 3, 1967. At the altitude of 31 km, the X-15 accelerated to 7,274 km per hour. Although the coating saved the plane, it was the second prototype's last flight. After some time, the coating was removed, and the rocket plane was restored. Since then it is displayed in the National Museum of the U.S. Air Force at the Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. The first X-15 prototype shared similar lot. Up to this day, it is displayed at the National Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C. The third X-15 prototype crashed in November 1967. Probably, the crash was the reason for program termination. In 1968, the first prototype performed only eight flights, before funding was cut off, 
and the X-15 program was officially terminated. Twelve pilots took part in the X-15 program at different times, and you know at least one of them. Neil Armstrong was an astronaut, the first person to walk on the moon. He performed seven flights on X-15, but didn't set any records, unlike another pilot, Joe Walker, appointed by the National Committee on Aeronautics. He reached a record flight altitude of 108 kilometers. He was the only X-15 pilot to cross the Kármán line, the imaginary line at altitude of 100 kilometers, used to separate the Earth's atmosphere from space. Joe Walker is also famous for colliding his F-104 fighter with an experimental bomber XB-70 Valkyrie, causing a crash, which killed him. The X-15 speed record was set by a U.S. Air Force pilot William Knight, and this record still hasn't been beaten, even if it's not recognized by the International Aeronautical Federation, reasoning that X-15 did not take off from land, but performed an air launch from a carrier. Despite the risks of high personic flights at high altitudes, the X-15 program suffered only one loss, the crash of the third prototype claimed the life of the Air Force pilot Michael Adams. While setting records is an integral part of progress, this is not a goal in itself. The X-15 program provided an abundance of information relating to aerodynamics, material sciences and thermodynamics. The data obtained were widely used in aircraft engineering and in space programs, such as Space Shuttle. Nowadays, commercial airlines are trying to master suborbital flights, but this is another story. You are watching Angels of the Sky channel. Subscribe us. Thank you for your attention. See you next time.